The Sana manuscript of the Quran is a palimpsest and contains two layers, an upper layer and a lower layer, and at least the lower layer does not match the Quran we have today. It's like watching the creation of the Quran before our very eyes. So let's take a look at what scholars have learned about this important early Quranic manuscript. Greetings, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and uh, I am so excited that uh, you know you have been interacting with uh, with us through this video series on creating the Quran. We appreciate your comments, and we look always forward to reading uh, your uh, interactions with us. We also we're looking forward to having any suggestions from you, whether related to this topic or others. And thank you for some of you even send us emails about maybe new uh, sources, data, findings, research, whatever the case might be. We're always appreciative of that. Of course, when I say this, I mean myself, Dr. J. Smith, who is with us here in studio. We've been talking about uh, carbon dating and we've used the Sana manuscripts as an example of that. And we mentioned it is called palimpsest because simply it has a lower layer that was washed off and then rewritten on it, what we call the upper layer. Today, we'll continue uh, with our discussions and unpacking of what uh, would that look like, meaning if we compare the lower layer to the upper layer, the writings, I should say, that is found on both. Uh, Dr. J, thank you so much as always. Well, it's always good to be here. Yeah. It's terrific that we're able to unpack this. Uh, what I want to do is I want to go to the slides and I want to talk about this, the lower upper layer. Uh, so let's go to the slides. You can see the two layers of the Sanaa Palimpsest. Is this the earliest manuscript we have and does it show an evolution in the text? That's the question. Right. That's when we want it. And, and you can take people to the slide. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Let's yeah. go ahead. Uh, this is a picture of it. Uh, you can see uh, on the left there is the Sanab manuscript. That's the upper layer. But when you look and put it under ultraviolet light, you will see that there are two layers. Can you see that blue picture? There's the lower layer in uh, just little faded, and then the upper layer. That's the later layer. So it's been wiped off, and then it's been rewritten over top. With by pulling it by uh, separating these two layers on the right, then you see the lower layer. So you can read it. Uh, you can and you can see that there are differences. What's fascinating, the person who has done the best work on this is well, maybe not the best work, but certainly the one who's written about it is. Uh, Asma Hilari. I have her book right here. Uh, this is called the Sana Palam says the transmission of the Quran in the first centuries uh, AH. That means yeah. uh, uh, Al Hijra. And I don't want to be fair. Uh, as a PhD student, I appreciated her work. And uh, regardless of how you agree or disagree with her conclusions, at least the bulk of the work that she's done, the body of the work, is very helpful. Yeah, I would suggest do get this. This is a good book. Yeah. Be careful of her conclusions. You can see why, because the other scholars who are looking at the same material as she did do not come to the same conclusion she does in the book. But give her credit, she was the first to get out there and she's the first to get it published, which was being brave of her to do that. And that's why it's important. And the good thing about it, she did have the entire script up there, the entire text up there, and she was that gives us available so that we, the rest of us, who don't have access to this manuscript, therefore can get the can see it. So here's what she found. Let's go back to the slides again. In the lower text, the lower, we're talking not about a full Quran. We're only talking about 63 verses. That's all that there is. Right. That's, that's all we have. However, amongst those 63 verses are 70 variants. That means variants with the upper text. Not with the Quran we have today, because even the upper text doesn't necessarily agree with the Quran we have today. Just between the two layers, we have 70 variants. There are verbs, there are nouns. 25 times there are different verbs and nouns between the layers. Sometimes articles are missing, participles, conjunctions are different between the two layers. Uh, 29 times you have difference in prepositions and isolated letters. Also expressions change. 16 times entire sentences are different. Mm -hmm. Now, some overlap with the same verses. Go ahead. Right. I want to just uh, comment. Uh, when we say Sana manuscripts, it's a collection of a lot of manuscripts. The one that we're specifically zooming in on right now is what we know as the DAM 01-27. Uh, That's the one that was done in the studies of Asma Hilali. Okay, so DAM uh, 1 slash 27. DAM starts for Dar al Mahtutat, you know, basically where it houses this in Yemen. Good. I'm not even going to try to repeat that. There's a yeah. man who speaks it fluently. Yeah. So here you have 
25 times different types of nouns and verbs, 29 times different types of prepositions, isolated letters, 16 times entire sentences that are different, some overlapping. We'll get into that in a future episode. I want to actually do a comparison and get your spin on it, get your feedback on it, because people say these are nothing really important. They're not really substantial. Yes, they are. Once you see the difference, you'll see it's quite substantial. Now, her, uh, her uh, comeback is this is called, this is nothing more than a school text. What is a school text? Well, what she meant is that it was used just for practice. Uh, scribes are being trained on how to write possibly from memory. And it was just, you know, done for that purpose. That's why it, it cannot be taken uh, as if it's an official Quran, but rather people tried their best as they are learning how to write it down and how to remember it. They did the best they can and they discovered mistakes. They missed something. They uh, butchered something. They thought the Quran was saying this. And that's the conclusion that she reaches. Yeah. And of course, you're going to see that the scholars don't agree with that. But nonetheless, at least she had to keep up. She had to keep in line with the standard Islamic narrative. So she had to come up with some excuse. That's a pretty good educated guess from her part. There are huge problems with that. We're going to get into that later on. So I would suggest this is not a school text for, for, for a number of reasons. We're going to get to that. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Quinn, who has probably done more work on it and should have run the one, been the one to write the book on it. It was her husband that was part of the team that went down in 1981 to look at it and to film it and put it onto uh, right, in, into uh microfilm, and that was confiscated by the Yemeni government when they started hearing what these German scholars were finding. They kept it there until the late 1990s when they finally gave him their microfilms back. And I, met, I went to see Dr. Garrett Quinn when he, was, when he first received it, and he was, he was the one that actually let me film, uh, take some pictures of the facsimile that he, he and his wife had put together. And it was fascinating because that facsimile, which we looked at in the, when we looked at the Sodom manuscript, they had orange marks all the way through it. And every time there was an orange mark, that was a manuscript variant. Mm -hmm. That's the, that was the, what he saw from, uh, from the, the Hafs Quran that we use today. So her conclusion was that this is nothing more than a nascent Quran with corrections, then washed off and rewritten in 705. But that leads, that reads up the questions as to why. So let's go to the next slide. Why was the lower text erased? That's the question we're asking. Because you have to, you don't just erase something. If it's that important, obviously it must not have been that important. Possibly uh, the text had faded and um, it was illegible. And that's why they didn't have to write over. Maybe that's the case. Yep. And I want to add, uh, you know, obviously we're saying why is it erased when in fact you're talking about a caliph who authorized this who can afford to buy leather pieces rather than to reuse some. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Another possibility that she came up with was possibly the text was inaccurate and needed correction. So now this causes some problems for a lot of Muslims. How can you have that which is eternal? How can you have that which has no error? How can you have that which has always existed that has no human interference? How can you have that which the Quran itself says no man has touched in chapter 10 verse 15, in chapter 15 verse 9, in chapter 18 verse 27, over and over again, this has not, no man can touch it because God himself in chapter 15 verse 9 protects it. If God himself self-protection, you can't have inaccuracies that need correcting. There's no room for correction. Man cannot even manipulate one word mm -hmm. or one letter. How many times have Yasser Qadi said this? How many times do you hear Muslims say this? Not one word, not one letter. So even when she made that suggestion, that caused hackles to be raised. She went on to another possibility. The text was obsolete and needed updated. Maybe it was a different type of grammar, needed a different type of preposition. Even that suggests that God has not protected it, that therefore when it was given to Or Muhammad, at least it wasn't preserved in memory as uh, we've been hearing. Yeah. And uh, I would go with uh, possibly number four because this is what we're going to get to when we get to the next episodes. Possibly the text was a nascent form of a later upper text. That's what I would suggest is going on, but I don't want to jump the gunion because I want to see what the other scholars have to say concerning this lower text. 63 verses, 70 manuscript variants. They are not just in, uh, insubstantiated. They're not small. Uh, they are huge differences that we're going to get to in a future episode. Wonderful. Thank you so much as always, uh, Dr. J. This is exciting, of course. Uh, people can see why um, you know, we're just really uh, having fun, enjoying this particular video series. And I'm hoping that people are benefiting from the work and the uh, efforts that is put together and uh, collectively uh, uh, here uh, in order to present this material to you. 
our hope is that you will first buy the book uh, because you're going to need it in your library, especially if you engage with Muslims. Number two, not only you take a look at what we cover, but even take a look at many of the other material found in the book. It's a big book. It's not just a few pages. Therefore, we cannot really cover every single argument or every single point that is made there. And I think uh, once you have your hand on a book like this, now you begin to see uh, previous episodes that we've done from previous series concerning the origin of Islam in general and also the origin of the Quran, you can see why those issues are extremely pivotal when it comes to what we call the standard Islamic narrative versus what is being discovered now as a completely different narrative as uh, it comes to the origin of Islam as we know it. Dr. J, thank you so much. We look forward to the next episode and a continuation of this exciting discussions. Until then, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sira International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.